ಸಂಸ್ಥಾಪಕಾಯ ಚ ಧರ್ಮಸ್ಯ ಸರ್ವಧರ್ಮಸ್ವರೂಪಿಣಿ ಅವತಾರ ವರಿಷ್ಠಾಯ ರಾಮಕೃಷ್ಣಾಯ ತೇ ನಮಃ ಶ್ರುತಿ ಸ್ಮೃತಿಪುರಾಣ ಆಲಯ ಕರುಣಾಲಯ ನಮಿ ಭಗವತ್ಪಾದ ಶಂಕರ ಲೋಕಶಂಕರ ಸೊ ವೆಲ್ಕಮ್ ಎವ್ರಿ ಒನ್ ವಿ ವರ್ ಡಿಸ್ಕಸಿಂಗ್ ವೆರಿ ಇಂಪಾರ್ಟೆಂಟ್ ಆಸ್ಪೆಕ್ಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಇಂಡಿಯನ್ ಫಿಲಾಸಫಿ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಇಂಡೂ ಸ್ಪಿರಿಚುವಲ್ ಟ್ರೆಡಿಷನ್ ದಟ್ ಈಸ್ ಆಲ್ ದಿ ಡಿಫ್ರೆಂಟ್ ರಿಲಿಜಿಯಸ್ ಸ್ಕ್ರಿಪ್ಚರ್ಸ್ ಇನ್ ವೇದಾಂತಿಕ್ ಆರ್ ಹಿಂದೂ ಟ್ರೆಡಿಷನ್ ಆರ್ ನಾಟ್ ಈಕ್ವಲಿ ಆಥೆಂಟಿಕ್ ಆರ್ ನಾಟ್ ಕನ್ಸಿಡರ್ ಟು ಬಿ ಈಕ್ವಲಿ ಆಥೆಂಟಿಕ್ ದಿಸ್ ಇಸ್ ಅ ವೆರಿ ಇಂಪಾರ್ಟೆಂಟ್ ಪಾಯಿಂಟ್ ರಿಮೆಂಬರ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ದಿಸ್ ಇಸ್ ಎಸ್ಪೆಷಲಿ ರೆಲೆವೆಂಟ್ ವೆನ್ ವಿ ರಿಮೆಂಬರ್ that there are some uh, religious traditions which consider every word every comma every statement as a revelation from god there is an inherent problem because many of these ideas must have originated perhaps several centuries ago and uh, they must have had some relevance in those days maybe 1400 1500 years we don't know and the world has changed human civilization has changed so if you apply them in today's conditions it can create very very serious problems ethical problems problems of you know in the religious conflicts all can happen if you consider every word in every scripture or even in the most fundamental scripture if you consider every word as divine that is a, there is a big problem it's almost like a time bomb so that's why i stress this important point uh, the number of canonical works in hindu tradition will run into thousands you have just to visit british museum library or the huge manuscript libraries of india not tens of thousands hundreds of thousands hundreds of thousands books and there are any number of manuscripts which have not yet seen the light of the day not yet published they are still in manuscript form if you consider every word of all these books as relevant for all time for the whole humanity it is a terrible problem so vedanta will tell you that according to vedantic tradition there are certain statements in the vedic literature which are universal which are humanistic in a very broad sense which are relevant for all times because they are concerned with questions of hum- human life and the fundamental problems of human existence not of one nationality race or religious group and that's so so i can give you here a, a definition of vedas by shankaracharya this is considered to be the most fundamental and important definition of what vedas are all about because if we go to temples all over india or even now in beria everywhere you find they are chanting all these books many of these books many of these uh, mantras they are chanting are all prayers prayers for job for money for wealth for children bank balance all those things you know but uh, health and so on are they relevant for all times are they relevant for the whole humanity are they concerned with the fundamental questions of uh, the meaning of human existence not necessarily so shankaracharya definition is atra rugadi veda veda tat pratipatyartham vicharam kurvanti idi vedakyam avapnuyuh athava sadbhavam sadhayanti idi vedah athava brahmadinam paramatmanam lebante idi vedah and this is a definition of vedas by shankaracharya in the sana sujadiya bhashya bhashya means a commentary a commentary that he wrote on the well known book it's not part of the upanishads but as important as the upanishads sana sujadiya but it means it says vedas i mean the essence of vedas what is the essence of vedas vedas discuss the reality of brahman vedas try to establish the fact that there is one one divine spark in all of us in everyone and that is an that is an omnipresent 
uh, immanent transcendental reality and they talk about certain spiritual disciplines which anyone can and should practice for example a sense of renunciation of lower things and sense of uh, let's say adherence to higher values and then self-restraint self-control in a, a serenity contentment peace and a strong urge for higher spiritual values plus yamas and niyamas which are already uh, uh, described in the yoga sutras they are also included i mean non violence contentment non possessiveness purity of life and then uh, connecting with higher ideas these are for, meant for everyone even for non believers so there is a higher definition of spirituality that goes beyond religion this is from shankaracharya so if you want to know what way does mean somebody who is making money by performing rituals will tell you where does means performing these rituals a person who is this that rituals are very very important very very important for spiritual life just as primary schools are very important kindergartens are very important city college also very important if you say education should mean only harvard and oxford or stanford there will be nothing possible in this world you have to you need plenty of schools and colleges and primary schools and kindergartens we need we need also places where small children should go and play in the in, during the weekend that is also part of education but that is not the end of education so shankaracharya says in the ultimate sense vedas means vedas constitute a method an ideal that takes you beyond the empirical changing uh, phenomenal things that will help you to discover your own true spiritual identity now how do we do that so there are four great statements in the vedas if you ask me the question can you give the, this essence of vedas four mahavakyas so vedas are nothing but four mahavakyas each of these mahavakya mahavakya means great statement let us say fundamental statements certain fundamental uh, uh, certain fundamental uh, vedic uh, statements uh, or expressions there are only four in number and all the other uh, important statements are attempts to explain to define and expand the essence of the vedic wisdom what are the four statements for example in the in the chandogya upanishad there is one statement chandogya upanishad is from samaveda so the statement is this it is simple tattvamasi don't ever get away with the impression that vedas mean only these four statements what i am telling you is the essence of vedas are these four statements and these statements are relevant for all people wherever people are trying to look for some higher higher meaning in life this statement is important it means the truth that you are seeking the god the divine that you are seeking everywhere else is actually within yourself within your heart that is the meaning of this statement is called tat tum asi tat means that absolute reality the transcendental reality that you are looking for that you are trying to discover that you are trying to understand to get a higher uh, uh, meaning of your own life that is that is the everywhere you know in a temple in a church in a synagogue everywhere it is there but all temples all churches all books all rituals are important but the ultimate purpose where these rituals and books and statements find a fulfillment is in the discovery that i should manifest the divine presence 
within me, then I became a spiritual person. And that divinity, that realization of the inherent divinity of our true identity should express itself in our words, speaking good words, in our acts, in our behavior, in our total personality. Now this is very universal. You don't have to be a Hindu or a Buddhist or Christian or anyone else to understand this. Anyone can do that. Even an agnostic will realize this real fact. So, Tattvamasi. And to understand, emphasize the point, Tattvamasi is the first Mahavakya. You know, because it is, the, it is an instruction. A young boy, his name is Swedagetu. He was sent to school by his father, Uddalaga, who is also his teacher. So the son is also actually a disciple of the father. But the father sent him for education elsewhere. After 12 years of education, the boy returns. And the boy is found to be haughty and proud. And then father uh, asked him the question, did you learn that by knowing which everything becomes known? A simple question. Boy didn't understand. He said he didn't, his teachers did not teach him. I mean, he, he, but, uh, uh, as a metaphor, symbolically what it means, did you actually learn the essence of education? The real essence of education. Education in the higher sense should be spirituality. That is what education finds its fulfillment. Now, after this discussion, and this, please remember those who are interested, please listen, please remember the book Chandogya Upanishad. It is an Upanishad belonging to Samaveda tradition. In its sixth chapter, which has 16 sections, this instruction, this word of instruction is repeated eight times. The first instruction comes in the eighth section and is repeated in the succeeding sections. Up to 16th uh, section, this is repeated. The boy requests his father to instruct him again and again. So, Saya Esha Anima Aitadatmi Vidam Sarvam Tasatyam Saatma. That reality which is present everywhere, that is actually your true nature, that is subtle, that is immanent, that is the ultimate truth, and then Tattvamasi, that is you yourself. The father did not mean to say you are God or you are Atman or anything, but he means say your own. True identity is that all-pervading divine spark which makes you, which helps you to look upon entire humanity, the entire creation as one spiritual unit, as one spiritual entity. This is the first Mahavakya, great statement. Now, the boy listens to Mahavakya and he didn't understand immediately the meaning and the father had to repeat eight times with eight different illustrations which right now we won't go into maybe in future in the future sessions we will discuss the father had to repeat eight times with eight different illustrations and examples and in the 16th section the boy clearly understood the meaning of it and becomes a spiritually enlightened person this is the first instruction. Now, when you listen to an instruction, you won't understand everything. So you need to practice some repetition. You need to uh, do some of your own homework. There is a gradual process from, uh, from an information, from an intellectual statement to real experience. After all, we have this overload of information in modern times, you know. So, an information is not very significant. 
But a great statement of fact as a great intellectual statement has its own significance. But that also falls far short out of real experience. You have to go a long way to uh, travel from an idea uh, to its real experience or this realization. During this interval, you have to do a lot of practice. So for that, there are four Mahavakya, sorry, there are three, uh, there are uh, different stages. During this interval, there are uh, certain practices for that. There are two Mahavakyas which represent your attempt to realize what you have learned. So from instruction to experience. Remember, in Vedantic tradition, first you listen, Sudhi, sudhi means you listen to an instruction, then you use your own intelligence and rational power, and then you reach the experience level. Shakarajari himself says, Sutya, Yuktya, Swanabhutya. One should listen, one should learn, then one should use uh, one's own intelligence, rational thinking, and finally he should experience it. Then only you actually become spiritual. Uh, so, during this interval, uh, there is a, an evolution taking place. Two Mahavakyas represent our attempt to uh, translate an instruction into an experience. One is Ayamatma Brahma. It comes in the Atharva Veda Upanishad, Mandukya Upanishad. Please remember, Tattvamasi is from Samaveda. It represents Samaveda. So it's the essence of Samaveda. Sandukya Upanishad. The next Mahavakya, which, which uh, corresponds to our efforts, our attempts to bridge the gap between instruction and experience. We should uh, transform what we learn into our true experience. So during that time, you have to meditate, I am Atma Brahma, the, the supreme truth within me, the divine truth, the divine spark within me, that's my true identity, that is the universal omnipresent reality. One should read, one should do meditation, and during that time you should perform rituals, you should perform meditations, you should also do a lot of philanthropical work, so karma yoga, bhakti yoga, all efforts that help us to evolve in spiritual life. This Mahavakya, it comes in the, it comes from the Atharvaveda Upanishad, Atharvaveda Upanishad is Manduki and Mundaka, these are from Atharva Veda. So, Atharva Veda is represented by Mahavakya, Ayam Atma Brahma, it comes in the Mandukya Upanishads. This immanent divine spark within me, it is the all-pervading reality. Then there is another Mahavakya, which also uh, represents our evolution. It is called Prajnanam Brahma. It comes in the Rigveda, it is in the Aitareya Upanishad, which is from Rigveda. It says Prajnanam Brahma, Prajnanetru Loka Prajna Pradishtha Prajnanam Brahma. That uh, supreme reality, that higher intelligence, higher refined intelligence that helps me to experience the supreme truth, which is uh, omnipresent that helps me to connect with the uh, divine which is present everywhere, that higher refined spiritual wisdom that is itself is Brahman. Now at the end you reach experience. So remember there are these stages, Sruti, you, you hear from a teacher, you learn from a book, then you practice your own meditation, your own slow, uh, gradual evolution. We are going to discuss that elaborately in the, within, a, within a few minutes. That stage, the interval between instruction and experience, from instruction to experience, there are two stages of contemplation, meditation, uh, uh, creating more and more self-awareness of what you have actually learned 
verbally. That is, I am Atma Brahma and Prajnanam Brahma. These two Mahavakyas. I am Atma Brahma and Prajnanam Brahma. They represent this interval period. The Lakshana Vakya and Siddha, Siddhartha Vakya that we will discuss later. We will elaborately discuss this. At the end of it, you reach experience. That experience is expressed in the great statement, it is simple, Aham Brahmasmi. That shows, that represents our experience. So, uh, well, uh, in a way, it is true. You know, what we learned at the beginning, we may hear from a teacher, we may read in a book, we may listen to some talks, and you, we are, you may be struck by the greatness, the grandeur of that great idea. And uh, then gradually we evolve, and finally it becomes our own experience. Those who have got any, any doubt about this, you can just read. I repeated this again and again in my sessions, the well-known, very little autobiographical work, uh, I mean, The Way of a Pilgrim, it is a well-known uh, book. I would say, uh, in my acquaintance with the Christian mystical literature, this evolution from an instruction uh, to towards experience, that is uh, very graphically portrayed uh, uh, in this book, in the, in the Way of a Pilgrim, where a pilgrim happens to learn about Jesus' prayer from St. Paul's uh, first epistle, where, from a sermon in a Russian Orthodox Church. It's a, it's a autobiographical work uh, from Russian mystical tradition, 19th century, the middle of 19th century, during the Tsarist times, middle of 19th century. So this humble peasant, he learns this, and then he decides to uh, make it a real fact in his life. Then he goes on moving all over the huge uh, landmass of Russia. His plan was to go to Jerusalem, which he of course didn't go eventually. He happened to meet a monk, a Russian Orthodox monk, from whom he learned the Jesus prayer experience, how to remain always in a state of prayerfulness. So you can see from an instruction to an experience. And this is something you have to remember. Now this is, this is something very universal. It is not actually in one religion alone you find. We learn a great idea and finally when we reach the experience level, there's a long distance that we must have traveled. So it is called Aham Brahmasmi. So Brahma Vaidam Agrasi Tadatmanam Eva Avev, you know, Aham Brahmasmi, it comes in the, in the Brihadaranyaka Upanishad. Aham Brahmasmi is a Mahavakya in the Shukla Yajurveda, Yajurveda is your two, Parts, Shukla Yajurveda and uh, Krishna Yajurveda. Shukla Yajurveda belongs to the Yajnavarkya tradition. This comes in the Brahadaranyaka Upanishad. The first chapter itself it comes. Aham Brahmasmi. So you learn the instruction, the truth that you're looking for everywhere is within you. And then you evolve. After a long time through contemplation and practice, you realize, well, Aham Brahmasmi, I am that absolute reality, this experience. These are four Mahavakyas. Now, these, these four Mahavakyas actually constitute the essence of Vedic literature, or I call Vedanta. Now the question arises, how do we evolve in this process? This is a very important question. So, so far we have discussed only four important statements called Mahavakyas. These represent the evolution of the journey of the human spirit, journey of every human being in spiritual space, so to speak. Now this is universal. It is not in one religion or one race, in one nationality, in one faith system that you find this. For every human being, you can find in the, in, the, in the story of the way of a pilgrim you find, everywhere you find, wherever uh, the human soul looks for something transcendental, something beyond a brickle, this is how the spiritual journey takes place. Now, 
in with with regard to this evolution the spiritual journey as a whole there are different views in vedanta this is a very important thing to remember different views these views can be divided into two broad categories those who are familiar with vedantic philosophy will know is called uh, two ways two methods of interpreting the spiritual journey and this uh, by i mean this classification took place during the post shankarite times remember it was shankaracharya who actually built the entire edifice the whole edifice of vedanta philosophy around these four mahavakyas if you read upanishads and this is something you should remember if you if you go to google if you go to wikipedia whatever may be there you will say upanishads constitute the philosophy then you read the chandogya upanishad and you read the brahmaranika upanishad you find many stories which are certainly not very universal so in the upanishads you find there are so many statements not all of the very universal so shankaracharya enters the scene he says okay these stories okay don't worry about it but you focus on these four mahavakyas so you can imagine practically the whole evolution of human spiritual journey you can put in your pocket if you have got a small tiny piece of paper you can write all these four mahavakyas you can write Uh, let it be, be in a tiny piece of paper practically the whole philosophy of spirituality is enshrined in these four statements and remember you make this statement to anyone no one can deny no one can deny the truth of the journey it is the journey of every human being not a hindu or christian or muslim or jew alone it is actually the story of spiritual journey of man and woman of course now there are two schools according to one school of philosophy they tell you well if you read the statement you immediately get this experience that is one view there is an opposite view they will tell you no it doesn't happen you don't get the spiritual experience if you just listen or you just imbibe one great statement it doesn't happen now during the post shankarite times there were there was a galaxy of great scholars dialecticians and philosophers in the advaitic lineage they can be divided into three fundamental schools vivarana prasthana bhamadi prasthana and vartika prasthana prasthana means a particular school of philosophy you can say augustinian school uh, the, in christian theology also you find there are different schools of philosophy neoplatonism is a distinct school of philosophy sophism is a dif- distinct school of philosophy like that so also during the post shankarite times three separate views developed while interpreting the spiritual journey centering around these four mahavakyas four statements now i can tell you interestingly don't ever believe that this is against temple because i can tell you one of the most famous temples in india one of the most famous temple which is visited by millions and millions of people every year only it is opened only for four or five months of the year and during that time perhaps about 70 or 60 million people visit that temple in that shrine you know the statement made tattvamasi is the statement there and there is a deity so god is sitting there and behind there is writing tattvamasi so how do you contradict how do you how 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 do you explain this because every every kind of ritual every kind of worship every a kind of religious festival is important is sacred is very relevant but it is an important journey it's a bus or a train that takes you to a destination 
it is not destination itself this is the so the, if you if you look at the mantras which are uttered in temples while performing puja in the final mantra actually will tell you let me be blessed to realize your presence within my own heart so every worship is actually uh, an act of inviting or invoking the divine energy present everywhere into a symbol in the in the picture or image or whatever is in front of you and finally you pray to that lord to enable you to realize that divine spark within your own heart now coming to the subject so i mentioned there are two fundamental fundamentally different schools one school will tell you that if you just understand this you can realize this the other school tells you no you need to practice for a long time uh, among these as i mentioned vivarana prasthana and uh, uh, vartika prasthana vartika prasthana was it follows the tradition of suresh racharya who wrote brahmadaranya uh, upanishad bhashya vartikam a super commentary on shankaracharya's commentary on the brahmadaranya upanishad it is called vartika prasthana and the other school is called vivarana prasthana it is also based on the teachings of another disciple of shankaracharya his name was patma pada he wrote panchapadika and panchapadika was again expanded and commented upon by prakashat mayadi is called the panchapadika vivarana so around this book also another movement evolved it's called vivarana prasthana they combined together so according to them if you just listen you get that experience that's what they say vivarana prasthana actually many of the prominent shankaracharya mats of india like singiri they all follow us of vivarana prasthana now how do you explain this suppose they tell you that if you just have what you call shravanavrt it means if you just listen from a teacher immediately it becomes a matter of your experience but all these views have their justifications in shankaracharya's commentaries this bison shankaracharya's views so they will tell you if you just listen for example tattvamasi immediately it becomes your experience so the truth is that if a person has already attained all spiritual qualifications that make him fit for the highest spiritual experience and then if he listens it becomes naturally it transforms into an experience so this is a simple thing suppose you are being practicing meditation reading higher books practicing unselfishness leading a pure life for a long time your mind has reached such a high level of purity and spiritual fitness and then if you just go to listen to somebody listen to a teacher seriously instructing immediately you will understand the truth of that instruction because the land is fertile so uh, and it is it is properly irrigated you removed all the weeds and grass from the soil and accidentally if somebody sows some seed it sprouts it becomes a plant it becomes a tree so that's an important thing actually this example you can find in cinderella of avila cinderella of avila herself uh, gives this this parable okay you can find a sower of the seed in the, in the new testament also you find so in vedanta it is called adhikari vada means the concept of fitness so a person who is already endowed with sadhana tadushta sampatti that is nitya nitya vastu vivega iha mutra bhala bhoga viraga samadesha ka sampatti mumukshuddu a sense of discerning this then between real what is real and what is unreal and the sense of renunciation of what is unreal upholding to what is real and then a sense of self restraint and self control and a strong urge for spiritual enlightenment if a person has got all these qualities 
then he goes and reads a book it will it will create deep impression on him actually we remember we are able to remember we are able to practice an idea only when we are actually ready for it it's just a matter of our own readiness and fitness so according to vivarna prasthana if you just if you are ready if you are fully qualified then a single instruction will be enough is something like this suppose you are driving a car every day from san francisco to sacramento every day you drive you are very familiar with the route you know every inch of the route you have to you are traveling you are driving and somebody ask you a question about a shop or a place uh, along the route you will immediately able to recollect if somebody explains to you about something a building or a shop or something on the way along the route if somebody tells you you don't have to struggle hard to locate in your mind the exact place that you are that be this being mentioned like that see look at siramakshana siramakshana did not need did not require a lot of preparations lot of practices uh, his guru totapuri just uh, instructed him the mahavakya tattvamasi immediately siramakshana immersing the samadhi aham brahmasmi became instantly his experience why because sri ramakrishna was in from his birth itself he was doing nothing but doing spiritual practices performing spiritual disciplines reading listening to scriptures doing puja doing meditation he was breathing spirituality he was thinking spirituality he was living in spirituality so such a person he became so his whole mind was absorbed in spirituality so when sri ramakrishna was given instruction by totapuri instantly it became a matter of experience so tattvamasi immediately were transformed into aham brahmasmi experience because just i gave i mentioned to you you know you were driving every day up and down from san francisco to sacramento then somebody has to uh, uh, and somebody has to teach you about a place along the route you don't need much instruction immediately you will understand so it means so that's called that is that's called vivarana prasthana it is very important because this is more of an academic program so i would like to uh, mention these technical terms but i shall try to explain in detail and if there are some sanskrit words which i mention which i quote which you are not able to completely understand during the lecture you are most welcome and i shall be much obliged if you can raise and i should be happy to explain during the interaction session the other school is called bhamadi prasthana so bhamadi prasthana bhamadi is a name of a work a commentary on shankaracharya's commentary on brahma sutras it is called bhamadi is a great actually it may be of interest for us to remember the 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 sublime lineage of advaita vedanta you know the author is called vajaspati vajaspati misra was the name of this was the author who wrote bhamati so he was he was a married man now he was completely devoted to advaita philosophy teaching writing and instructing that was a typical scholar of those times he married it so happened that he married but feminists should not <laughs> raise a word of objection to this but the story is so beautiful the story of a, an ideal husband and ideal wife together they uh, they, they became they, they made a great contribution to the sublime uh, spiritual philosophy of advaita so vajaspati had already started writing his tiga is called commentary on shankaracharya's on commentary on brahma sutra is called it's called bhamadi anyway so he had already he had not given that name he was writing after marriage also he continued writing so he had become quite old and the book was reaching its completion so one day it was evening 
and he was writing and the lamp was about to uh, it is flickering there's not enough oil in the lamp so he found an old woman was coming and pouring oil in the lamp to keep it alive and he looked at he found it was his own wife whom he married years ago he had forgotten everything else the lady also was equally great she found her husband was writing was writing a great philosophical spiritual classic so she found she thought it was a privilege for her to be part of that endeavor and by helping him by taking care of everything she also became uh, a partner in this uh, holy task of writing a spiritual philosophical classic and uh, at this man suddenly a few drops of tears uh, fell down his eyes because he found he had completely forgotten his obligation of matrimonial life then she said i, I shall go make you immortal by giving your name to this book which i am going to write and remember bhamadi is one of the outstanding immortal dialectical work in vedantic tradition after shankaracharya's own works in the next category this is one of the most wonderful classical work it's called bhamadi tika so bhamadi was the name of the wife whose name was immortalized by her husband who recognized her true greatness because without her cooperation he would not have been able to complete such a gigantic spiritual intellectual process of bhamadi tika no so the school of bhamadi again it was followed it was commented upon by 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 another great scholar his name was amalananda and he wrote a commentary kalpataru and then another great scholar uh, his name was payadikshita who wrote parimala so bhamadi kalpataru parimala this is this three, three together these works constitute a huge uh, wonderful edifice of dialectical philosophical classical literature in advaita tradition according to bhamadi school that we are we are going to discuss now according to their their views you do not realize if you just listen you have to practice a lot and you have to increase your own spiritual fitness to really understand the implications of what you learned so they will tell you the technical name is shravanavrutti you go on listening and then you will get only intellectual knowledge paroksha jnanam paroksha jnanam will eventually becomes aparoksha jnanam through a process of meditation karma yoga and different spiritual disciplines and then eventually you reach the highest spiritual enlightenment you you realize the implication of the mahavakya mahavakya uh, should be always is an important term maha means great vakya means statement so the four vedas can be compressed into four simple brief statements tattvamasi ayam atma brahma prajnanam brahma and finally the experience aham brahmasmi so according to vajaspati and his school of philosophers they will tell you that by just listening alone you do not get experience you need to go through a process of spiritual disciplines is called prasankhyana prasankhyana mean dhyana abhyasa practicing meditation suppose you are uh, you are wonderfully uh, impressed by a great teacher and you understand you want to experience it you are very sincere and you go on contemplating on the meaning of the statement slowly if your mind is completely absorbed in the contemplation on the meaning of the statement then that will also influence your whole life your thoughts words and deeds all will be influenced will be colored by the great thought is that's going on in your mind you're concentrating 
on this great statement. If you chant some devotional hymns, for example, in any tradition, suppose mentally you are chanting a devotional hymn. The Christians will some so many Hindus. There are, there are wonderful devotional poems in Hindu tradition. You know, many of our temples we chant these beautiful, wonderful slokas and stotras and kirtanas, bhajans. If you mentally contemplate on the meaning of these, even, even if you do not fully understand the meaning, still, if you do that, slowly you find the meaning will slowly start entering into your mental system. And that will, so if people chant these great mantras and slogans and these devotional hymns, you know, that influences their life. That brings them peace of mind, serenity, because when you go on listening to beautiful, wonderful mantras and uh, devotional poetry, which contain great ideas, they cannot fail to uh, bring your mind into a state of serenity, peace and a kind of inner contentment. That's why we enjoy listening to great music. We enjoy chanting, reciting Chandi or other stotras, you know, we, we repeat these oh, different mantras because they get a piece of peace of mind. Why? Because those sound symbols, mantras are influencing your thoughts, your mind, your emotions, feelings, and this they, sublim they sublimate, they refine, they purify our emotions and feelings and thought currents. So slowly you understand the true meaning of it because you begin to evolve. The dhyana abhyasa I means prasankhyana in the broad sense what it means contemplating on the meaning of it and that will naturally uh, help us to practice karma yoga, to practice unselfishness, to practice contentment and purity of life. So this is one view. Both views are actually correct. Why? If you are really fit, you will immediately get the experience. I give the example of Sri Ramakrishna. Sri Ramakrishna just listened once to Mahavakya from his Guru Totapuri. Instantly, it, is, it became an experience. On the other hand, those who, have, who don't belong to that category, normal spiritual aspirants who are doing a lot of work, they have they do, maybe they may be doing the office work, they have engaged in so many other activities. They may not be able to spend a whole lifetime uh, and energy for the spiritual disciplines. For them, every day, literally, they practice slowly. That practice will deepen uh, the spiritual aspirations and that will help them to reach experience level. So from instruction to experience, from Sudhi to Anubhuti. This is the evolution of for Mahavaya Vakyas. So you first listen Tattva Masi. I mentioned earlier, you know, in the Chandogya Vinishad, Uddhalaga had to repeat eight times. First he gave an instruction, then the same instruction he repeated eight times, and his son, Shwedagedu, his disciple, requested him again and again, please repeat again, you see, Bhūya eva ma bhagavān vijñā payatu idi tata somi idi ho vācha. Please uh, repeat once more. But actually, every time when the boy received his instruction, he repeated this request to repeat again. And each time uh, the teacher uh, instructed with an additional example or a parable. One of the parables is very, very famous. It is, it is something very interesting. That with that, with that, we'll conclude. The parable comes in the 14th Khanda, 14th section of the 6th chapter of Chandogya Upanishad, which again, please remember, it belongs to the Samaveda tradition. So, that particular section is called, you know, Gandhara Purusha Drishtanta, it is called. Abhinadhaksha Purusha Drishtanta. What it means is the example, the parable of the blindfolded man, 
that is the meaning the example or the parable of the blindfolded man the story that story brings in the essence of this evolution of spiritual journey from instruction to experience this is something very interesting so once it so happened in ancient times a man was in india for a long time after receiving vedic education he was returning to his hometown the hometown is called gandhara which is which corresponds to today's kandahar in afghanistan which is part of a very very famous uh, part of ancient vedic tradition in the vedas were very very much prevalent in ancient time punjab and haryana and afghanistan all these places today's pakistan included the all the geographical regions with the cradle of vedic civilization once upon a time later of course buddhism also became very prominent in afghanistan so anyway that's a different story so the story goes like this uh, remember this is in the brihadaranya upanishad uh, uh, sorry it is in the chandogya upanishad samaveda in the chandogya upanishad the parable of the blindfolded man is called uh, gandhara purusha drishtanta or the, the parable of the man from kandaha Uh, abhinadaksha I mean, uh, means somebody who is abhinadaksha purusha drishtanta so the parable of the man who was blindfolded he was in india he was returning to his home town in kandaha and on the way he was ambushed he was uh, ill treated and all his properties were taken away by him from him by a group of robbers and then he was dragged into a thick forest and was tied to a tree and the robbers went their way now after some time this man began to shout and cry you know i was ambushed i was ill treated my property was stolen by robbers and tied to a tree in this thick forest he began to shout and a compassionate pedestrian traveler who was walking with traveling along the same route he heard this noise cries coming from the thick forest he entered the thick forest he untied the ropes and brought this man to the main road then told him you take this road and you can go back to your hometown so this compassionate traveler who was who was familiar with the route uh, where entered the thick forest and um, untied his ropes and removed his uh, uh, blindfold and brought him to the main road and instructed him how to get back to his uh, hometown this is a story now in this story the whole story is now taking a different meaning what it means this traveler the spiritual seeker spiritual aspirants and he was uh, uh, he, he he was um, robbed by his own desires his own worldly desires worldly instincts then he was uh, left a, a, in the thick forest blindfolded he had become ignorant of his true identity he did not know how to get back to his hometown so what should he what should he do if he keeps quiet no one will come to his rescue he will be trouble so you have to make a lot of noise so every spiritual seeker should make a lot of noise how do we make noises go to the library read the upanishads read uh, read some spiritual books at least read i would say emerson thoreau or whitman that's something good beginning because that will help you to think of something beyond the, the empirical world of you know everyday life problems so somehow we should develop a higher uh, perspective of life so we should make some noise making noise means it is called you know a kind of healthy restlessness spiritually healthy go to the one book read some great books and discuss with somebody that's the beginning of spiritual journey for many spiritual seekers actually and then finally you may meet somebody who can give you some clear instructions and but when you receive instructions you should have your own intelligence your own uh, ability your reasoning power 
so Shankaracharya has written a very wonderful, beautiful commentary. It's a graphic story of our spiritual journey. He says, we are blindfolded, so we should make a lot of noise. Then somebody will come and take away the blindfold. We lead us away from the thick forest and bring us to the main road. Then, Edandrasam Gacha, go this way, you can get back to your hometown. Then as we walk in that direction, we, sh we may be tempted to look in this direction or that direction. We may be tempted by worldly enjoyments or amusements. There may be a beautiful garden, maybe some wonderful sweet mango somewhere. So I would rather go and eat some mangoes instead of continuing my journey. You should not do that. So we should have steadiness. So Pandido Medhavi, like that, Shankaraja writes in his commentary. We should, he should have the ability to remember what, he, what instruction he has received and then he should, be, he should have the power to remember, to retain his mind, Methavi, and he should have a sense of proportions, sense of discerning wisdom. Then only he will speak, he will reach his spiritual journey. So you can imagine a single phrase, Tat Tum Asi, three words. The entire chapter, sixth chapter, is built around this statement. In the story you find the, the beginning of the first section, Khanda, Uddhalada uh, comes home and he had already left his child somewhere for education. The child returns. Uddhalada asks him some questions. The child, you know, sub, suppose somebody who had, uh, say, a school boy, a boy has returned home with some high grade and he thinks, and he, the father asks him some questions. The father, the child uh, doesn't show much modesty or politeness. So the father asks him, did you do enough? Did you learn this thing? That thing, a good compassionate father will ask him. The child suddenly finds that he has a lot of things yet to learn. That, that's how the story begins. The, all these stories are maybe of contemporary relevance, very relevant for those times. But Tattumasi statement is relevant for our times because if you reach the if you reach the experience level of that statement that when you reach Aham Brahmasmi then you can look upon the entire humanity as one spiritual family you don't quarrel with anyone you don't fight with anyone you look upon the entire humanity entire creation as one spiritual family now this message comes from the Vedantic Shankaracharya says these ideas constitute the essence of the Vedas. So that's why he mentioned, you know, in the definition of Vedas, his statement, Brahmadhinam Paramatmanam Lebhanta Yidhi Veda. That is the definition. Means. Vedas will teach you the truth of Brahman, the all-pervading reality. I mean, the whole creation is one spiritual family. So universal. So important. So, you know, why this ideas are important in our time. There are many people who will tell you Vedas are cock and bull stories and there are so many things and you can find in the mythological books so many things you can find. They are not very, very important. That's why Vyasa Smriti makes a statement. So this Purana nam virodho yatra drishyati tatra saudam pramanam siya tayodvaithe smriti vara. Sudhi smriti puranas. Three Levels of canonical literature. Sudhi means Vedanta. And Veda, in Vedanta itself, the essence, these four Mahavakyas. They, will, they take you towards the realization of your own spiritual identity. So universal. If this idea is not properly uh, represented, or if the, some of these ideas in the Smritis, law books, and mythological books, Puranas, do not correctly represent or reflect this universal spiritual ideal, then Vyasa himself says, don't take my own Smriti seriously. Then you know? So the Vyasa himself admits. No, I, I have to, of course, now suddenly I remember one important thing, you know. There was, uh, there, were, there were some questions, um, raised in the 
comment section uh, by some friends who listened to uh, my previous lecture, that is uh, second lecture, the third one. So one question somebody raised was this, uh, what about Vyasa? Because in my previous uh, uh, classes on Padanjali Yoga Sutras, which were again recorded like this, uh, we discussed, uh, very elaborately we discussed Vyasa's commentary on Padanjali Yoga Sutras. So, and we are still speaking about Vyasa. Who is this Vyasa and who was the other Vyasa? So somebody raised this question. So the answer is this. So we have to remember, uh, there are innumerable Vyasas mentioned in our spiritual philosophical lineage. It's not the same person. The, the one who uh, classified Vedas into four uh, groups, four categories, Nirvigveda, Ejurveda, Samaveda, and Atharvaveda. That Vyasa was an ancient Vedic sage. And all Vyasa mentioned in the Bhagavata Purana was perhaps the same Vyasa. But the commentator called Bhashyakara of Patanjali Yoga system is a different Vyasa. So, Stve Patanjali Vyasam Shankaram Chamunitrayam Kartra Sutrasya Bhashyasya Krabha Vivaranasija. The Munitrayam of Yoga tradition. So, Bhashyakara, the one who wrote a commentary on Patanjali Yoga Sutras, that Vyasa is a later figure. Uh, relatively, he lived closer to, uh, I mean, maybe perhaps around um, um, 900 BC or so, but the Vyasa who uh, classified Vedas was a much, in, much more ancient teacher. This is an important point to remember. Another question that was raised in the comment section was something like this, about hierarchy. So, I mentioned there is no hierarchy, uh, so then we have the Ramanuja tradition, Shankarajarya tradition, Madhva tradition, Vallabhajarya, Nibbarka, Chaitanya Mahapu, and so many tradi lineages. So remember, when I mentioned that there is no hierarchy in Hindu tradition or Indian philosophical tradition, what I meant was, there is not a single church who decides this alone is right, that alone, that is wrong. That kind of uh, personal, uh, pers uh, personal hierarchy doesn't exist. Hierarchies are the different lineages are there, but uh, no one can tell you that uh, you are wrong because you, you are not worshipping God in this specific fashion. Absolutely, no one can tell you. That kind of hierarchical rigidity is uh, totally uh, absent in Hindu tradition. That's why so many deities, so many different forms of worship developed in India because this is a huge country, of course not as geographically certainly much smaller than America, but demographically it's a huge population, diverse uh, uh, cultural traditions, you know, 23 different language systems. So for, if we include other dialects, there are any number of language uh, speech systems in India which uh, some of them with rich uh, ancient literary tradition. So, it is a very diverse culture. So, so many different types of uh, ideas of God and methods of worship evolved. In fact, Swami Vivekananda makes an interesting statement in this context. You know, maybe in light heart it's better, it's, better, it's better for everyone to have his own or her own God. What it means is, we create our idea of God depending upon our own spiritual evolution. My idea of God will very much depend upon my own spiritual evolution. A primitive person will think, God, my God is sitting here, he is in very good terms with me, and he is certainly not in very good terms with others, so I should fight with the other tribe, and if I can conquer the other tribe, then my God also will conquer the other God. This sort of tribal warfare uh, took place in ancient times. So that sort of thing is totally inconceivable in Hindu tradition. In that sense, there is not a single man-made structure that decides that this is right and that is wrong. No. If A is right, it doesn't mean that B should be wrong. B also can be right. 
C also can be right in different respects, different areas. All can be so many roads ultimately leading to the same spiritual goal of uh, our own self realization or self self discovery, sp spiritual enlightenment, as mentioned. So, thank you very much. Now we have an interaction. You are most welcome with questions. Thank you. Namaskar. I have several questions, Swamiji. So, in the, the scriptures, you said there is Shruti, Smriti, Purana. What about Itihas and letters that belong? Which one? Then these three schools of philosophy, you say they are called Prasthana. Prasthana, yeah. What is the significance of the word Prasthana? I missed. Yeah. So, Givara Prasthana is the one which says that after the Sadhana of Chatushtai was fulfilled, yeah, 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 yeah. No, okay. no, good what question. about the Vartika Prasthana? Something? Yeah, I mentioned so. First of all, you know, we were and not and Prasthana. What are the which, which one do they follow? So? Yeah, we were not Prasthana. They, we were not Prasthana and Vartika Prasthana. That is Suresh Rajarya's tradition. They merged. Padmapada is, you know, Padma Panchapadhyaya and Panchapadhyaya Vivarana Pagasatmedi. Vivarana Prasthana. And then, uh, uh, Suresh Rajarya Abhasavada, you could say, in Vartika Prasthana. He wrote this Brahadar Nyobanishad Bhashi Vartika. So, uh, there are only minor differences between Abhasavada and the Vivarana school. So, they both merged more or less and they both accept this uh, one particular term which I did not use. Anyway, you raise it because it is called Shabda Aparokshavada, which means if you are spiritually fit, you could sadhana sadhushta sampatti. If you have already got all the essential spiritual qualifications, then even if you listen, it's called sravana prati. I mean, if you just listen to sravana, proper sravana, to bhavakyas, immediately it will lead to aparokshani bhudi. Aparokshani bhudi means the immediate transcendental experience. So, Aparokshaknana, that is the ultimate goal, Jiva Brahma So, that happens if you just listen. I give the example of Sri Ramakrishna. And I also give the example of somebody driving a pan down every day from Sacramento to uh, San Francisco and back and forth. Now, the point is, if a person is already immersed in spiritual disciplines, his mind is so much evolved, if he just listens, immediately he strikes him as a fact of experience. That's what happens. As if you are, again, you have to give the example of driving. If you are driving every day for years, then no one needs to tell you, no one needs to instruct you for a very long time. You don't have to look at the Google when somebody tells you on the way along this road there is such a place where you stop maybe for uh, having a cup of coffee or tea or something like that. You immediately will remember that restaurant, whatever it is. So, because you are so familiar. Like that, Sri Ramakrishna was the whole lifetime, he was practicing meditation, puja, contemplation. He was immersed in spiritual disciplines. So, when Tottaburi just instructed him, it became experience. Shankara Dikvijayas also mentioned, some Shankara Dikvijayas, Mentioned that Shankaracharya had the same experience when uh, Govinda Bhagavad Pada instructed him Mahavakya uh, Sravana, gave him Mahavakya Sravana. It is called Shabda Parakshavada, I mean instant enlightenment. In the Mandukya Kairika Bhashya, Shankaracharya writes very elaborately about this. It, it means Sravana itself is enough. Sravana means, literally means listening. But here it means, you are already immersed. You are already immersed in spirituality. And you already know it intellectually. Because you, through, by your own evolution, you are understood. If somebody tells you, it becomes just a confirmation, like a revision. This is one. This is the view and uh, the, the, the prominent months of Shankaracharya mostly follow Sabda Abharakshavata. Uh, the, the other one is called Prasankhyana Vada. Prasankhyana means Dhyana Bhyasa. You continuously practice meditation, Karma Yoga, Puja, all this. Necessary, it's important. How? Because what you listen to, what you heard, you want to go deeper and deeper into what you heard. 
you contemplate on the meaning of what you have heard and along with that you also practice lot of contemplation and meditation and one day eventually you get shabda you reach you reach this aparokshana bhuti but it's a gradual process this view was held by bhamadi school so bhamadi is a tika that i explained in detail is on shankaracharya's brahma sutra bhashya and then uh, so they believe in tattvamasi shravanam and shravana shravanavarti then paroksha gyanam then aparoksha gyanam that is their evolution their method uh, that's a parimala kara you know parimala that is alpa apay dikshita and kalpaduru amalananda they all follow this bhamadi school very prominent school bhamadi is important because the work itself is unique in many ways and needs a teacher to guide you at every point you cannot just read like a novel it you need a lot of knowledge of logic and a lot of background so one of the most wonderful dialectical works during the post shankarite period in the advaitic tradition okay unique work so the bhamadi school is in a way in reality there is no difference bhamadi school tells you that if you don't have sadhana sadhusya sampatti if you have not attained all the necessary qualifications then after listening after shravana you go on contemplating meditating and performing karma yoga and rituals slowly you increase your fitness you increase your fitness when you reach the higher level of fitness you immediately becomes uh, aparakshana bhuti establishing sadhana eh no, yeah establishing sadhana sadhusthaya yeah, you, 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 you get more and more establishing sadhana sadhusthaya sampatti through this prasankhyana but in the shabda baroksha concept shabda baroksha was the vivarna concept it they are talking about those who are fully qualified fully yeah so practically the same it is same there is no real difference but you know philosophers want some difference the great the glory of india's philosophical heritage was people were actually fighting over this oh you believe this in fact see it's just the grand year the sublime the sublimity of a culture where you discuss all these transcendental matters the the, the you should meditate or you should not meditate you can imagine uh, how profound how sublime uh, how beautiful such a intellectual culture should be that's that's the greatness of it and we in 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 western tradition were unfortunately uh, during the post augustinian period people mostly lost the habit of fighting intellectually for a good cause you can imagine in neoplatonism during the, the post uh, socrates period they produced great thinkers for free philo plato and others the beauty and the charm the sublimity of intellectual fights you having a big discussion in vedic tradition it's called parishad assembly of great pandits coming together in a court and discussing philosophy and logic if you do that more and more in today's world in this overload of information and the short attention span if you can think of these great books and fight over no this is the idea that that, that itself can can take us a different high higher spiritual culture because philosophy takes you closer to spirituality it is not an it's an alternative to spirituality remember philosophy it's certainly not philosophy in the proper sense of the term it is not not an alternative to spirituality but it takes you away from the mundane empirical level and helps you to think of something less dangerous less troublesome that's the point if you if you if a kandian a utilitarian Uh, engage in uh, engage in some kind of a uh, intellectual dialogue dialogue in modern times is wonderful <laughs> that's what i'm talking about okay thank you you can imagine the transcendent the, the glorious period of america the, during the transcendentalist you can imagine emerson's journals his ideas uh, the walden in in hindi thoro in walden a small book he talks about so many things the glory and the beauty the charm of 
trees and mountains and phones and <laughs> and the intrusion of the modern technologies intruding to this space of the animals and forest. So it's a it's a different world, you know. That's the idea behind. Thank oh, you. One one quick follow up. Yeah. The epics Ramayana Mahabharata they are part of Itihasa, they are not part of Purana. No, they are so. the Idihasa. Idihasa. Yes. Part history, part mythology. Of course, you know, modern excavations reveal that Ramayana and Mahabharata are not just myths. They do have a historical background, but uh, they, of course, there is a mythological aspect also. After all, they are they are literary classics. And literary... Well, if you could place the Itihasa along with the Shruti Smriti Purana. Yeah, Itihasa, sometimes they are included as a subcategory of Puranas. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Certainly not Smurdis. But, but there are statements in these uh, classics which are more like Smurdis, but they are not part of the uh, traditional Smurdi literature. Smurdi Dharma Shastra, they could together, you know, mostly deal with do's and don'ts and constitutional things. How Vaidika Dharma was practiced in those days at different levels of society, among kings and monks and householders and novitiates, like that, you know, so Drupa Dharma, Raja Dharma, and all these things. So, very different, yeah. Because yeah, thank you. <laughs> Namaste Maharaj. No, thank, um, thank you for the wonderful clarification yeah. today. Uh, my question is on the two things that were reverberating throughout the uh, lecture today is yeah. uh, creating that fertile ground and also uh, the concept of uh, shouting out, like you talked about Gandhara uh, example. So my uh, question to you is, can you give us those references on what to read from Shankaracharya? to create that fertile ground and to enhance our knowledge. Yeah. Uh, and uh, if I may add my own reflection, maybe this is a separate time I need to have conversation is, uh, you also mentioned the importance of rituals. Rituals and chanting, for my own journey, it has helped understand your lectures much better. Yeah. It has purified me, my ground has got fertile. So my more question is first on the pointers from Shankaracharya, the books to read. Second, any more guidance on creating that fertile ground for better understanding. Yeah. Uh, that was all my questions. Yeah. You know, Shankaracharya refers to sadhana sadhushta sambhati, the four important qualifications, and sravana manana nididhyasana. I mean, reading scriptures with meaning and contemplating the meaning of the scriptural statements and, of course, meditation, meditative practices. So, all these are clearly explained in one small book, Viveka Chudamani. During the early part of Viveka Chudamani, you find Adho Nitya Nitya Vastu Viveka Parikatnidhe, like that, he begins, he, he defines what is Shraddha, what is Mokshutam, and mean urge for spiritual enlightenment. All these are very clearly, what is the meaning of Shama, Dhamma, all these are very clearly uh, clarified and defined and explained in the Viveka Sudamani. And also, if you are interested, uh, you can read the, the Bhashya on the 14th Khanda, 14th section of the 6th chapter of Chandogya Upanishad, the, where this uh, example of the blindfolded man, Gandhara Purusha, the man who came from Kandahar, it comes there. And in his Bhashya, he says, this man is shouting, he is blindfolded, he is tied to a tree in a thick forest. He says, you know, look, uh, look at me, I am left alone here, I, all my things are taken away and I am blindfolded. Now, the blindfold, the ropes with which they tied him to a tree and the forest itself, the journey, the travel, all these are their counterparts in our real life. A traveller is a, is a normal spiritual seeker. The forest is this world, this life, world, world, worldly life of problems and challenges. And the blindfold and all these are our own karmas, our own karmas, vasanas, vrutti, samskaras and so on. So, like that, a person should develop a, a strong spiritual urge, uh, like the man who was, uh, who was shouting. And so somebody heard. If he had kept quiet, nobody would have heard him. 
he would have remained there and perished in the thick forest. So he shouted. Like that, we must also uh, develop uh, what we call a healthy restlessness, a healthy, uh, what, what do you call, Parinama Dukkha, it is called a Yoga Sutra. It means an ability to sublimate our sense of imperfection to something higher, becomes, which becomes transformative. Parinama means transformative. If you can worry about something higher, that worry itself will take us to a higher life. If we can just lift our, uh, our level of concerns and worries and anxieties to a higher level, that will help us in a spiritual life. That's one. They get rituals you mentioned. That is very important. Actually, you can even, you can even uh, scientifically prove, if you constantly listen to some higher ideas, even if you keep a record of some devotional poetry or any chanting of Om or any tradition, you know, what they consider to be holy, that, is, that, that cannot fail to influence the way you think, the way you act, the way you behave, really speaking. So also when you perform rituals like puja, we do with great concentration, great attention. That kind of focusing our entire mental energy on something that we consider a secret, that itself has a, a sublime impact on our personality. We see when you perform ritual or when you participate in a ritual, you attach a special kind of sanctity and sacredness to that. That uh, if you mentally, if you attach a kind of sanctity and sacredness, that will influence the way we think, the way we act. After that, when you return to your apartment, you feel a strange inner serenity and calmness and quietude. It is, it is something very precious in these modern times. A sense of sanctity and sacredness and meaningfulness. Yeah. Thank you, Maharaj. The, There's a question from YouTube, Maharaj. Yeah. What part of Mahabharata and Ramana, do you find this a myth? The, the, uh, the, uh, the highest and the most sublime part of Mahabharata uh, is Bhagavad Gita itself. Hmm. There are other other uh, uh, parts which are called Gita, like Vyadha Gita, another famous poem, which is highly philosophical. Bhagavad Gita is the zenith, the peak of Mahabharata. Mahabharata is again, its part is three part mythology and part ethics, it, it has everything in it. Ramayana also, Ramayana also contains many great teachings, uh, Rama's instructions to Lakshmana, all these are very important things. Yeah. So thank you so much uh, for this discussion. Om Shanti 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 Hari Hi Om Tat Sat Sri Ramakrishna Arpanamastu Sri